Well, there is a phrase, a common phrase that we've all heard. It says, uh, you're preaching to the choir. Uh, and that means that, hey, you're telling someone something they already know or that they're already doing. Uh, today, I think I'm preaching to the choir to a lot of you, but that's okay. Because I, I just want to tell you something I'm very, very passionate about. I want to talk about God's vision for the church so even though I may be preaching to the choir, just indulge me, okay? Because this fires me up. Let me begin. In 1967, during the African-Nigerian Civil War, the American Red Cross was gathering supplies, medicine, clothing, food for the suffering people. Inside one of the boxes that showed up at the collecting depot one day was a letter. And this is what the letter said. We have recently been converted... And because of our conversion, we want to try to help. We won't ever need these again. Can you use them for something? And inside the box were several Ku Klux Klan sheets. The sheets were cut down to strips and eventually used to bandage the wounds of Africans. It could hardly be more dramatic. From symbols of hatred to bandages of love. But this is our God. These Ku Klux Klan members had considered themselves their entire lives Christians while practicing racism, hatred, and even violence. But one day, Clarence Jordan, a white preacher, a farmer, a New Testament scholar, the author of the Cotton Patch Paraphrase of the New Testament, he was instrumental in founding Habitat for Humanity. Clarence Jordan showed up to preach at these Klansmen's church. And they heard these words, words like, God is not a celestial prison warden jangling the keys on a bunch of lifers. He's a shepherd seeking for sheep, a woman searching for coins, a father waiting for his sons. And then they heard these words. I'll put it on the screen. They heard these words from Clarence. It is not enough to limit your love to your own nation, to your own group. You must respond with love even to those outside it. This concept enables people to live together, not as nations, but as human beings. And with these powerful words from this white preacher, these clansmen were radically transformed. Like Paul on the road to Damascus, scales fell off their eyes and they saw their evil ways and they were changed, friends, radically as only God can do. They went from destructive religion, bigotry, racism, to transformative, redemptive, restorative, healing, faith, and grace. I grew up in church, and I am thankful for that because I learned a couple of things. I learned that Jesus loved me. I learned that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But growing up in church, there was also a lot of fear and division and pride and judging and control, not just in my church, but in the church in general. So when I went to college, I went to business school, I had a crisis of faith. I wasn't sure what I believed. And then I, I, I met and was transformed by the reckless love of God's grace as I read the words of Brennan Manning's book. In Brennan Manning's book, The Ragamuffin Gospel, let me read you what transformed me, what awakened me. He writes, because salvation is by grace through faith. He writes, I believe that among the countless number of people standing in front of the throne, in, front of, in the front of the Lamb, dressed in white robes and holding palms in their hands, as recorded in Revelation 7-9, he says, I believe I shall see the prostitute from the Kit Kat Ranch in Carson City, Nevada, who tearfully told me that she could find no other employment to support her two-year-old son. He says, I shall see the woman who had an abortion and is haunted by guilt and remorse, but did the best she could faced with grueling alternatives. We shall see the businessman besieged with debt who sold his integrity in a series of desperate transactions. And we shall see the insecure clergyman addicted to being liked, who never challenged his people from the pulpit and longed for unconditional love. And we shall see the sexually abused teen molested by his father and now selling his body on the street, who, as he falls asleep each night after his last trick, whispers the name of the unknown God that he learned about in Sunday school. But how, do you ask? How? Then the voice says, they have washed their robes and have been made white in the blood of the Lamb. There they are. No, 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 no. There we are. 
The multitude who so wanted to be faithful, who at times got defeated, soiled by life, bested by trials, wearing the bloodied garments of life's tribulations, but through it all, we clung to faith. My friends, he writes, if this is not good news to you, you have never understood the gospel of grace. Mm. At that moment, that book, I became a student and an advocate of grace. I began to work with students, wanting them to know about God's radical grace, that no matter what they had done or what somebody had done to them, that God had a plan for their life and God loved them, that God loves them unconditionally. But at the same time, I still didn't know what to do with the adult American church that too often looked like how Jesus described the religious leaders of his day. He would tell the religious leaders of his day, you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of dead and everything unclean. He would say, you make rules up to, to give to people that you can't even keep. And then in the midst of all of that, I'm working with students. I've discovered grace. I read a chapter in the Bible. I read a chapter in the Bible that changed everything. I read a chapter in the Bible that not only described the condition of the American church, but a chapter that all of a sudden gave me hope for the American church. It excited me. It gave me direction. It awakened me. It made me begin to dream about what the church could look like. Like, like, like those Klansmen and like me, that the church, when we discover grace and it's done right, the church can radically restore people and bring healing and change and hope to our world. It's a chapter of great promises and hope. But it's also a chapter where we must own up to our truths. The chapter, which is what our church is named after, is Isaiah 58. Let me read you the first part of the chapter. This is God speaking. Shout, a full-throated shout. Hold nothing back, a trumpet blast shout. Tell my people what's wrong with their lives. They're busy, busy, busy at worship and loving, studying about me all the time. To all appearances, they're a nation of right-living people, law-abiding, God-honoring. They ask me what's the right thing to do and love having me on their side. But they also complain. They also complain, why do we fast and you don't look our way? I love the next line. Why are we humble and you don't even notice? <laughs> well, here's why, God says. The bottom line on your fast days it's about profit. You drive your employees much too hard. You fast, but at the same time, you bicker and fight. You fast, you worship, you do spiritual activities, but you swing a mean fist. The kind of fasting, the kind of worship you do won't get your prayers off the ground. Do you think this is the kind of fast day I'm after? A day to show off your humility? <laughs> to put on a pious long face and parade around solemnly in black? Do you call that fasting a fast day that I, God, would like? And then he says, this is the kind of worship. This is the kind of spiritual activity. This is the kind of fast I am after. Here it is, friends. To break the chains of injustice, to get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do, God is telling his people, is to share your food with the hungry. Invite the homeless person into your homes. Put clothes on the naked and be available to your own families. Do this, and here's the exciting part of this chapter. Do this, and the lights will turn on, and your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help, and I will say, here I am. This chapter changed everything. It became and is my life chapter. See, Isaiah poses the question, what would it be like for the people of God to be faithful in fulfilling their side of the bargain? It's a pretty good bargain. It's, it's actually a covenant. In chapter 5 of Isaiah, God describes his people like a vineyard planted on a fertile hillside. The land has been cleared and watched over so that it may thrive. It's a reference to God choosing his people and making a good covenant with them, promising to bless them. And it says, God looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Verse 7 of chapter 5 says, He looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but heard cries of distress. God is seeing his people. 
Ignore, ignoring cries of distress, ignoring justice. Despite that, the theme in Isaiah still is that God forgives and that God blesses and he protects if we will return to him with just, compassionate lives. And in this incredible book of Isaiah, God's rescue plan for all of humanity is developed. Chapter 7 through 12, we read about God sending a child, the Messiah, to bring justice and righteousness to the earth. And then in chapters 40 to 55, we read about God sending a servant to bring us peace. And in both cases, this child, this servant, will draw all nations to the Lord. So the question remains, what does God require of us? God was faithful in delivering his side of the covenant. Christ came and he brought us peace, reconciliation when there was no peace. God was faithful in delivering his side of the covenant, but what is God looking for us and from us? Well, Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, we get a crystal clear picture of what God requires of his people. The crystal clear precursor to God moving and healing and his light bursting forth is that we live just and compassionate lives that are concerned for the oppressed. In the Academy Award nominated movie, Harriet, it's on Netflix right now. I encourage you, if you haven't seen it, watch it. Amazing. Tells the true story of the runaway slave Harriet Tubman and her incredible bravery in helping many other slaves in the 1850s southern states of America escape on the Underground Railroad. It starts with a confronting scene in which the white landowners and the slaves are at a church service. And like those Klansmen we talked about earlier, the landowners clearly see no contradiction between owning slaves and their faith. Harriet Tubman is a remarkable African-American woman, a woman of deep Christian faith and courage, and she had a remarkable prophetic gifting, perseverance, and faith. But as you watch the movie, aside from the cruel slave owners, there are privileged, privileged white people in the film who actually stand up against evil at great cost to their own position. One is a white landowner named Thomas Garrett, Thomas Garrett, who was a Quaker, who helped 2,500 African Americans escape slavery using his house to hide them on their way to freedom. For this, he was harassed, arrested, and convicted, leading to his financial ruin. Thomas Garrett stood up in court, and I quote him. I quote, I'm going to put this on the screen. This is what he said in court when he had lost it all. He says, Judge, you have left me not a dollar. But I wish to say to you and to all in this courtroom that if anyone knows a fugitive who needs shelter and a friend, send them to Thomas Garrett and he will befriend him. God! You know, Thomas Garrett was well-to-do, successful businessman. Reminds me of the words of Jesus, to whom much is given, much is required. It's probably, those are watching, not everyone, but it's probably more likely you and I, compared to our world, you and I will be asked to take a stand like Thomas Garrett on behalf of the oppressed rather than as the oppressed. I can't speak for us all, but certainly to, to many, if not most of us, I want to put this on the screen. We need to begin to approach the scriptures from a self-awareness of our power, wealth, and privilege to whom much is given, much is required. So the question posed to us is, will we as God's people keep our side of the covenant and take our stand on the side of the oppressed, the voiceless, the wanderer, and the hungry? The three sections of Isaiah 58. The first is the question, why doesn't God seem to hear us? The second thing, God kind of says, listen, you're doing all these religious activities, but you're on the wrong side of justice. You're ignoring injustice. And then finally, God promises some amazing things if they respond rightly. The complaint of the people of God during Isaiah's time is a common one. God, aren't you impressed by all of our religious activities, but you don't seem to notice. Have you ever found yourself saying the similar thing? God, I come to church, I pray, I read the Bible, I do devotions, I receive communion, I don't drink too much. So where are you, God? So God responds. He responds to their questions. 
It's an amazing passage. Certainly cuts to the heart. God's response is, you may be observing all kinds of religious practices, but you exploit your workers, you fight amongst yourselves, you ignore injustice, you look the other way, away from widows and orphans, the foreigner and the poor. What I really require of you as God's people is this. It's this simple. Loose the chains of injustice, set the oppressed free, and then I love this. And in your shared humanity, in your shared humanity, feed the hungry, shelter the poor, clothe the naked, take care of your family. One of the things that we see in Isaiah and in the life and teachings of Jesus is the powerful principle that underpins ethics and Christian virtue and practice. Namely, it is this, and I will put this on the screen because this is the title of my message. In Jesus, there are no non-persons. In the Judea Christian worldview, everyone is created in the image of God. Everyone has value. Everyone is to be treated with dignity and compassion. To love our neighbor is to know that there are no non-persons. Every life matters. Every life counts. And if we are to reflect the character of God as people of faith, we are to be on the side of justice that God cares for us to be about. If we are to fulfill our side of the covenant, we are to be on the side of human dignity. We are to be on the side of the oppressed. As a Live 58 church right now, God asks us to be on the side of forgotten seniors, hungry bellies, dirty water, unhoused children, refugees and immigrants escaping violence and death. The church is to be on their side. The book of Isaiah, it's drenched in the fulfillment of these passages. To Jesus, there are certainly no non-persons. In fact, the day before Jesus' crucifixion, he says, hey, this is, let me tell you about judgment day. He describes the final judgment. He just says, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. How does God ultimately separate his true followers from pretenders, the sheep from the goats? Feed the hungry, give something to drink to the thirsty, invite the stranger in, clothe the naked, and visit the prisoner. Let me just give you a few thoughts, just a few thoughts here. Three things, actually. For those of you who are parents and grandparents, teach your children Isaiah 58. You know, it was very confusing growing up because our church did a lot of religious activities, but I don't even think I'd ever heard of Isaiah 58. Read it to, to them, and then you model it. You model caring for those that are called non-persons in our world. Lead by example, parents and grandparents. I think of my two grandchildren and what I want them to know. They don't need to know a whole lot, but I want them to know their papa cares about those that God cares about. The second thing is this, do something. Now, here I am preaching to the choir because so many of you do something, but sometimes we can look at our world and the homelessness and refugee, and it just is overwhelming, and we just don't do anything. We, we're not called to do everything we're just called to do something. Uh, uh, theologian Edward Edward Hale said this. I love this. I, I love this. He says, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And I will not let what I cannot do interfere with what I can do. As a safe, simple, servant-focused church, we know we can't do everything, but we're going to do something. And then the last thought on this, and I've already talked about it, but I really do. I want us to approach scriptures from a self-awareness of the power and wealth and privilege God has given us, to whom much is given, much is required. And then the scripture says this, when you do this, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear and your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. You see, I, I love the spiritual disciplines that draw us close in our relationship to God. There's nothing wrong with them. In fact, I encourage them. Worship, scripture, reading, fellowship, prayer, all of those things. But it's interesting to me. Isaiah 58 states that these are not the things that lead to revival, to the presence of God, to the healing of our land. Our light breaking forth, healing will quickly appear. Righteousness and God's glory appearing is not is not contained in our religious activities. No, it is our demonstration of justice and compassion. 
It is our actions, not our words. It is our money and time and not our thoughts and prayers. Isaiah 58 describes what revival looks like. When our fasting and seeking God is matched by our standing for justice, our compassion towards the poor, then God will move in in ways we have never, ever seen before. That is my prayer. And that is a worthy cause to spend our lives on. This is a Live 58 church. Well, she was born in a war-torn country. And as a baby, was shipped off to a foreign land to live in an oppressive refugee camp. Her mother was with her, and she was a fighter, so she and her baby girl escaped twice from the camp, only to be caught and brought back to unlivable conditions. When this baby girl and her mother, who could never return to their homeland, they were surrounded by people who had lived in this camp for at least one generation. But they miraculously, her at the age of three, and her mother were allowed to come to a country that at the time believed in the biblical mandate that, as Leviticus says, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Well, this country, this little girl and her mother came to was the United States. And a small church in San Diego who also believed that there are no non-persons. And they believed in the heritage of God's people to welcome the foreigner from Abraham to Jacob's ten sons, to Moses and his brother Aaron, to the entire nation of Israel, to the prophet Elijah, to Ruth the Moabite, to the ultimate refugee, Jesus, fleeing with his parents to Egypt to escape death. This little small church, little band of brothers and sisters in San Diego, And may I say they didn't say it, but they were a safe, simple, servant-focused kind of church. They partnered with an amazing refugee organization to bring this baby girl and her mother to a safe community where they were mentored, supported, loved, and given a chance to live with dignity and safety. And this little girl grew up. It wasn't always easy, adapting to a different culture, a different world. There were challenges, but there was love from this little church that could not do everything, but they could do something. And it allowed her to flourish in her intelligence. Eventually, she graduated from college. And today, she helps and advocates for and stands up for those who are oppressed. And she is living out the contract and the covenant of Isaiah 58. All because a small church, a small band of brothers and sisters welcomed her in. And this little girl is 29 years old today. And she is the mother of my grandson whose name is Isaiah. In the first century church, followers of Jesus were known as people who would adopt abandoned children, serve the poor, fight and die for justice, and stay in plague-filled cities to care for the sick while others fled to safe places. Rulers and governments were intrigued, confused, and even threatened by the willingness for them to give up their lives for others. The early church left a permanent mark in the secular history books of the day. What will history write about today's church? The prophet Isaiah said when the church is busy with spiritual activities, it's powerless. The church's power comes from caring for the poor, feeding the hungry, fighting injustice, and protecting widows and orphans. The impact of the church is not predicated on the frequency of meetings or the eloquent nature of its rhetoric. The impact of the church has to do with its willingness, let me read it, spending our halves on behalf of the hungry and satisfying the needs of the oppressed, and then... And then our light will rise in the darkness and our night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide us always. He will satisfy our needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen our frame. We will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose water never fail. You will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called a repairer of broken walls and a restorer, like our t-shirts say, a restorer of streets with dwellings. That, my friends, is the definition of revival. And I close with the words of Tony Campolo, who said, Jesus never said to the poor, come find the church, 
but he says to those of us in the church, go into the world and find the poor hungry, the homeless, and the imprisoned. For friends, the church, the church is always at its best when it leads with the motto, there are no non-persons.